Man, always a privilege and honor to be here with y'all. Uh, and uh, we got some celebrating to do. Yesterday was Pastor Aaron's birthday. Man, that guy is old. Ah, gosh, yeah. You know, a couple months ago, I was here, and Aaron told me how old he was backstage, and I was like, I said some non-church words when he told me his age. I said, get your AARP card, guy. Like, you got to take you to Denny's for dinner. I think he's at dinner right now, actually. That's, that's, what, that's probably what he's doing, man. No, man, real talk, man. I love Aaron and just his leadership uh, over this church and over this community uh, all these years. Like, I tell you, like, man, being a pastor is hard work. I know, I know you think all we do is golf, uh, but being a pastor is hard work. It's hard on families. It's hard on kiddos, uh, spiritually, emotionally. Uh, and, and I would just encourage y'all today, if you call Hillside your church, um, man, shoot a text message, a Facebook message, a uh, Instagram message, a Snap Face message, I don't know what else, but like shoot Pastor Aaron a note of encouragement this week, thanking him for what he's done for this church, what his family, his wife, what they've all given. I mean, like scripture talks about honor, do, give honor where honor is due, man. And, and A, I know you're not watching because you're at dinner, but I just want to tell you, man, we honor you and we thank you so, so very much. Last week, I saw that you guys were uh, wearing name tags, kind of kicking it old school here. And everybody was the video, Stacy, who does your social media, you crush it, Stacy. Like, like everybody had like these name tags on it. It's like, oh, here's what my name means. Here's what my name means. My name is Carl with a K. Okay, like you don't want to be a third grader named Carl, right? It's like with big glasses and all that stuff. So I asked my dad, I said, Dad, where'd my name come from? You know, I'm one of eight kids, I'm number seven. So like when you get to the seventh, you stop caring about certain things. And they're like, oh, where did my name come from? Is it like special? <laughs> Millennials, y'all all got special names. You're so special, right? Like my name is Carl. And, and he says, uh, I named you after a janitor at my job. Cool, cool. Thanks, Dad. That's it. Just, yeah. <laughs> but real talk, like, I started thinking, I was thinking about this this morning. I said, what made my dad name me after this fine custodial worker at, at, at his job? Maybe, maybe this Carl guy was, like, super generous. Maybe he was, like, just a happy guy, just, just smiling ear to ear. Maybe he was a guy who, who'd, who'd fill the room with joy whenever he walked into it. Maybe he was just a, a caring guy, a listening ear. But something happened in his relationship with my dad that, that, that impressed on my dad to say, hey, name your kid after him. Because names matter. Names matter. And as we're strolling through this series, the names of God, we're looking at all the different names of God throughout Scripture and how each name reveals something about God's character, reveals something about a truth about God, reveals something about God that God wants us to understand about him. But before I give you the name of God that we're going to study today, I want you to think through this question, because I think it'll help establish where we'll go today. In your everyday life, do you trust that God is a God of his word? In your coming and going, do, do you trust that God is a God of his word? In Genesis 22, the text that we're going to be in this morning, and I'm going to teach a little bit differently than I normally do. I'm going to go like verse by verse, just right through this thing. Some of you might be bored, some of you might be interested, but, but I believe God has a word that he wants to say to you today through this. But in this, in this passage, what we're seeing in Genesis 22, we're introduced to a man, well, we're, we're revisited by a man named Abraham. Now, give you the backstory of Abraham. This is in the, the, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, penned by Moses, Genesis. He, he, Moses is giving kind of like the, 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 the lead up to what's going to be. And, and here in Genesis, he introduces at the beginning to a guy named Abram. Abram is this guy who's kind of living out in his space. He, he's, he's a faithful God. God. God looks down upon him and he says, all right, Abram, I, I want you to go. And God gives Abram a command to go. He doesn't tell him exactly where he's going to go, but he says, I want you to go. And then God says, I'm going to do something in you and through you, Abram. I am going to make your descendants like the stars in the sky, like the sand, like the, like the uh, sand on the seashore. I'm going to multiply this world through your descendants, Abram. And, and so much so, I'm going to change your name. 
And your name is now Abraham. And then God makes a promise to Abraham and to his wife, Sarah. And then God takes a very long time to bring that promise into fruition to fulfill the beginning part of that promise. And then unexpectedly in chapter 22, God asks Abraham to sacrifice the blessing of the promise. And when we read scripture from that perspective with our 21st century uh, eyeballs and lens on, it doesn't make sense. It feels weird. It feels odd. It feels, it feels just upside down. But here's what I want you to understand. See, Genesis 22 is meant to be read the way the whole Bible is meant to be read. You see, Scripture, these collection of 66 books, are first and foremost a biography It's a biography that testifies to the person of Jesus. And when we read scripture through that lens, the whole of it becomes clear. When I look at all the passages in these 66 books in this little library, and I look at it through the lens of a testimony of Jesus Christ, it begins to put into clearer view my understanding of the text. So let's look together. Genesis chapter 22 verse 1. It reads like this. Sometime later, Abraham, God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, he, he said to Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the, burning, for the burnt offering, he set out for a place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship And then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac's back, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. Verse 6 is unbelievable in terms of its theology and what it's pointing through its Christology. I'm going to nerd out today on this text. Oh my goodness, right? As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father! Yes, my son, he replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where, come on somebody, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Underline that if you're taking notes, it's going to be key. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Listen to me, somebody, you got to get this. If you don't get anything today, you got to get this. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. God himself has provided the lamb for the burnt offering. And the two went on together. When they, verse 9, when they had reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged on the, the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. But an angel of the Lord called out to him and said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Three times we hear that that reply, here I am in the text. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. For I know what you fear. Excuse me. For I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, he took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place. The Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on that mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. In verse 1, God calls out to Abraham, and Abraham says, here I am. Understand this, my friends. Listen, here I am. God calls and God commands. 
God calls and God commands. But there is something that happens in between the call and the command. God sets a moment, a holy breath, to see if we will be obedient to what's on the other side of the command. Every single one of us, we have received a call by God and we have received a commandment by God. And God waits patiently to see if we would be obedient to his call the option will be obedience or disobedience will you obey me or not see in this text right here this is the first time that love is mentioned in the bible not the love of God for, for himself, not the love of God for the spirit, not the love of Adam for Eve, but here the love of God is, the love is pronounced in connection between a father and a son and set in the middle of that love is sacrifice. And every phrase God speaks to Abraham cuts like a knife. He says to him, take your son, your only son, Isaac, he says his name, not to get it confused. Whom you love. Parents, remember holding that baby for the first time, the way it welled up in you, that love. We just saw the dedication to those young men and young women. The ted, it's like this love fills in you. And imagine the, the thinking back 30 years to Sarah giving birth to Isaac. And here God is saying, here he is. Offer him there. It's a burnt offering. You see, God often reveals himself in the contradictions of life. As he is about to show you and I something about himself, but also something about ourself. This burnt offering didn't mean that, 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 that it would just be, Isaac would be just burnt alive. It means that Abraham had to kill Isaac by cutting his throat and, and then set him on fire. And, and, and in that time, the, the, it was understood that as the, as the, as the bloom, as the flume of, 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 of smoke would rise, it would fill the nostrils of God and bring joy and peace and happiness to God because something has to die for man to commune with God. And what the writer is pointing to us here is this, is this, is this, is this obedience don't come easy. Come obedience to God does not come easy. Everything in this world comes easy. Being a follower of Jesus Christ don't come easy. It requires something of you. Listen to me, listen to me, friends. If your walk with Jesus has not yet required something of you, I ask, are you actually walking with him? This is how I'm constantly measuring my development, my walk, my followship of Jesus. Is it costing me something? So Abraham, Abraham gets up early the next day, gathers his things, and begins this journey. Now, I love this. Abraham got up early. You know why? Because he wasn't going to tell Sarah what he's about to do to her son. Men, we are smart. Right? Like, men, we get up early to do important things. Right? Valentine's Day, we're all at the grocery store together. <laughs> Paying $50,000 for these old roses. Walk in with that coffee like we meant to do it. Like, here you go, dear, I love you. Right? He gets up early and he goes and do the thing. And verse 4 says, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Catch this. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. 
wait a minute, I thought in verse 3 and two, 2 and 3, he said you're going to take your son and you're the one who you love and you're going to sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. But here in verse 5, Abraham saying, no, 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 we're just going to go up there and we're going to worship and then we're going to come back to you. You see, Abram has resurrection-shaped faith. Scripture doesn't tell this, but I'm going to make some conjecture a little bit here. I think Abraham believed that he was going to kill Isaac, and I think he believed that the God who called him Abram and called him from his place to this place where he is today, the God who promised him a son in his, in, in, in his youth, but then gave it to him in his old age when Sarah is barren. I think Abraham's like, God's done some stuff before. I believe that even if I kill this boy, God will bring him back to life. And for three days, Abe's walking. He's walking. He's walking with his son, these two, these two servants, and Abe's thinking about what God asked him to do. He's thinking about what God called him to do. And on the third day, he looks up and he sees where it's to happen you see, often there is a period of waiting on God. Not so that God's heart or mind would be changed, but I think so that our hearts and our minds can come into alignment with God. I think many of you are sitting here this morning, you're watching online, and you're going through a season, a difficult season, a stressful season, a depressed season, an anxious season, and you're worried. You're like, God, 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 God where's the answer? Where's the answer? Where's the answer? Where's the answer? And God's like, you got to wait. You got to wait. Because I'm trying to bring you along. To how I see things, how I understand things, how I fulfill things. And God is like, and while you're waiting, you know what I want you to do? Pastor Brian, just talk about it. I want you to worship a little. Yeah. I want you to worship in your waiting. We worship in our waiting because we are lifting up a shout of praise. This is where I don't know becomes a shout of praise. Somebody asks you, what's going on with your life? I don't know. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> what's going on with your finance? I don't know. Thank you, Lord. What's wrong with your kids? I have no idea. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> this period of forbearance points to the grace of God. If you're waiting, understand that God is in the background working. Amen. He's working on something for you. It just may not come at the time that you desire. It may not come in the way that you desire, but he's saying to us, listen, in your doubt, in your hurt, in your uncertainty, in your difficulty, when things don't make sense, draw close to me. Draw close to me. Listen, some of y'all bedside Baptists watching online. You laugh in this room. Y'all ain't here every week. Mm. Mm. But I'm here today, Carl. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I watch church online. I watch my own church online. I work there, and I still watch online. I get it. Some days you need that online day. Can I tell you something, folks? There ain't nothing like the house of God. I'm going to tell you this. Listen, online people, I love online. What God does is going to do through this evolution of the internet and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Listen, I'm all for it. But you're missing something if you're not in the house of the Lord, gathered with God's people. Listen, listen, if worshiping with God's people. Now, listen, if you live in, in Omaha, if you live in Nebraska, if you live in, 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 in Boise, Idaho, listen, yeah, watch this online, all right? But every Sunday, get your butt in a church, in a local church. Give to this one, but get your butt in a local church. Because you know what happens when you worship in the waiting with the people of God? You look around you and you go, I'm not alone. Yeah. I'm not alone in this. And that's what's happening as Abraham's climbing that mountain. He's thinking back, God, you have not left me before. You won't leave me now even in this difficult situation. Verse 6. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried... Ooh, Brian, this one preaches. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, 
placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went together. Does this sound familiar? A father carrying the tools of judgment, a son with a wood piece of wood up his back, climbing up a hill to be sacrificed because the father said he was going to sacrifice him. Uh, you, you, you're tracking? We're talking about Jesus. Some of them are like, what's everybody clapping about? I don't get it. It's another view. It's another view of what Jesus was going to do for humanity. Paul writes about this in Romans 5, 19. For just as through the disobedience of one man, this is Adam, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience, come on somebody, of one man, the many will be made righteous. Hear me on this one, friends. We cannot experience real love without sacrifice. You cannot experience real love without sacrifice. If somebody tells you they love you and they have not sacrificed for you, they don't love you. Girls, women who aren't married, men who aren't married, let me save you some dates. Save you some money. If they say they love you but you have not witnessed sacrifice in this relationship, that sacrifice ain't going to come. You don't wake up one morning and just decide, I'm a sacrificial kind of person. God will often test our love for him by calling for our Isaac. God will test your love for him by calling for your Isaac. You know what your Isaac is? That treasure. Whatever you're white-knuckled about, is your Isaac. A relationship, finances, an opinion, a preference. God will test your love for him when he says, do this. Isaac spoke up in verse 7 and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb? Come on, somebody. Where is the lamb for the burnt? Oh, he's like, pop, pops. I, I, listen, a, pop. Isaac is probably 30 years old in his 30s around here. So he's like, I've done this before. I understand the sacrifice, sacrificial system talked about in Leviticus. Where's the lamb? Pops, what are we killing here? <laughs> understand this. Understand this. Understand this. Abraham never told Isaac what he was going to do. So Isaac is here following his dad through the wilderness for several days. No answer, no conversation. Trust built upon connection and relationship. Hear me on this, somebody. Listen, some of us are trying to find God when God's like, why don't you just walk along with me? God, where you at? Where you at? Where you at? He's like, I'm walking. You're too far behind. But, 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 but God, but, but, but God, I got I to gotta, I gotta know. Come on. Come on. So much strife and struggle in our life is because we need all the answers. Remember back in the day where you, you didn't have any answers to anything? You say some wild stuff to your friends and you would just write because you argue loud. That's how I got through life. Everybody's like, man, Carl's smart. No, I just, oh, I'm loud. Now I say, son, everybody jump on the Google machine. No, that's wrong. I don't think so. We try to put God in the Google machine. Wait, God, I'm, I'm sick. Where's my answer? God, I ain't got no money. Where's my answer? God, my kid's not. Where's my... God ain't in your Google machine. See, the Lord will put you in a situation that he alone must take care of. God will put us into circumstances and situations. And you know why he does that? God can do everything. Ready? God can do everything except experience our commitment. So God foresees and creates situations where he can come down and experience our 
commitment. Flawed, broken people that choose something greater than themselves. And this burnt sacrifice is an atonement. An atonement is something that makes God and man at one. An atonement brings the separation of God and man and puts it at one. Mark Devers says it like this. The Bible, when atonement is talked about, it means that a price has been paid for our sins that has a result of bringing sinful us together with holy God. When we have been reconciled, called back to God, we understand that Christ made an atonement. That's Bible language. Christ made an atonement for our sins. He paid a price, his own life, that God accepted for us on our behalf. So we are now brought back to God. You see, Abraham had to learn the difference between trusting the promise and trusting the promiser. God's promises often, God's promises often, it feels like it becomes our responsibilities to fulfill God's promises. So we take it into our own hands and even at the chance of disobeying God, we say, hey God, I know you got this universe thing going on, but you gave me this promise. It hasn't happened yet. So now I'm going to jump in. I'm going to do my thing to make that promise come to pass. And God's like, slow down. I got this. It may not feel like I got this, but I got this. When Paul writes his letter to the Galatians, Paul calls back to this story. And he says, look at this. Now, the promises were made to Abraham, to his offspring, singular. It does not say to his offsprings, referring to many, but referring to the one and to your offspring who is Christ. On that mountain, God began writing a story that would not be answered for 2,000 years. God said, people Wait, and when you see what happens, you will understand how I am in all things, in every nuance, every detail. Carl, what does this have to do with me in 2022? God is saying, I am in your details. I am in the nuances. I am in every single moment. And though I haven't brought it to fruition, though I haven't brought the complete answer you desire now, though it may never come on this side of the cross, you can trust me. You could trust me. Pastor Keller says it like this. On the cross, Jesus wins through losing, triumphs through defeat, achieves power through weakness, comes to wealth through giving all away. So in verse 11, the angel called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Listen, when God says your name twice, you better pay attention. And how does he respond? Third time in the text, here I am. What did I tell you at the beginning? There's a call, there's a command. What's the command this time, Lord? Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything for him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now I know you fear God. What does fear God mean? It means to take God seriously. Yeah. People hate the Bible. Oh, it's always talking about fear God. I don't fear no, fear nobody. I don't. You are upside your mind if you don't fear nobody. You know what it means? It means you don't take people seriously. Many of us don't fear God, but we won't turn down that one street in our city because we fear what's on the other side. Many of us don't fear God, but we all up in our taxes because we fear the IRS. Many of us don't fear God, but we fear all these man-made things. And it means that we don't take God seriously. Where I don't think I need God, I don't obey God. Where I don't think I need God, I don't fear God. Some of y'all, you're like, hey, Carl. I don't need God when it comes to my finances. I'm not talking about y'all that are trying to rub two pennies trying to make it sense, trying to make sense. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those of you who have multiple savings accounts and 401s and Roth IRAs and, and other words that I don't really understand. 
You're looking at, you, 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 come on, man. Some of y'all, if I ask you exactly how much is in your bank account, pff, you know it to, to a penny. And you go, no, no, Carl, my guy at Goldman Sachs, he handles that. My guy at, at, at Schwab, he handles that. And when Aaron says something I like, I'll tip a little bit. Ooh, come on, somebody, I'm all in your business. When he says something that lines up with my preferences, I'll give him a little something, something. You know what? You don't fear God with your money. Because you're not being obedient to God with your finances. You're not being obedient to God in your generosity. Because listen, you're, you're being all tight-fisted with 10% or whatever it is, right? And he gave his son. God doesn't know what it's like to be me. You ever said that to yourself? He's God. He's perfect. He don't know what it's like to be me. What the writer of Hebrews tell us? For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy, find grace to help us in our time of need. So in verse 13, Abraham looked up and there in the thicket in his time of need, he saw a ram caught by its horn. He went over and took the ram, sacrificed it as the burnt offering instead of his son. You see, God re didn't reveal the answer till he saw Abraham's commitment. You're chasing God for an answer. And he's like, when have you really committed to me? But God, but God, but God, but God, but God. See, friends, God's provision leads to his provision. His prevision leads to his provision. When God sees in us, when he sees in us, and we, he sees that we choose to follow his foresight for our lives, that is when God says, okay, now I'm here with you. And sometimes you got to wait. Look at Hebrews 6, 15. It says this, and so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. It was after he waited that God blessed him with the promise. And Abraham understands something that God wants to make clear to us all today. Sacrifice involves sacrifice. Sacrifice involves sacrifice. Sacrifice is to lay something down so that you can pick up something better. I'm laying something down so I can pick up something better. Are you tracking with me? Abraham was ready to lay down his son so he would be seen righteous in the eyes of God. He was willing to lay down something good for something better. So Abraham called that place, verse 14. The Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on that mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Second Chronicles tells us that that mountain in the region of Mori Moriah is where the temple mount in Jerusalem would be built. Adjacent to the temple mount, you know what we find? Golgotha. Calvary. Isaac is the only blood of his son, the hope of the world, the source of all blessings. And he's trudging that wood up that hill on his back, adjacent to Temple Mount, reminding us, pointing us to what Jesus was going to do two millennia later. What Jesus was going to do on the cross where the father is holding the tools of judgment. And he looks at his son and he says, put that wood on your back, climb up that hill and be a sacrifice. 
Christ. But you know what happened that day? All through the text, the lamb is talked about in future tense. And there's no lamb slaughtered on that day, only a ram. And God points to Calvary. 2,000 years later, when Jesus walks up it, the same way Isaac walked up it, the same way that God looked over his son Jesus Christ on that Good Friday, God is looking over us. And in that moment, Jesus takes his last breath. And you know what he says? He says, it is finished across Jerusalem. You know what's happening? It was Passover. So there were hundreds, thousands of people that came to Temple Mount, that came to Jerusalem with their little sacrifice. Their little something. The little pigeon, the little lamb, the little goat. And they're waiting to get to the front of the line so that earthly priests could kill that animal and say this word, it is finished. That's what the priest, the high priest would say when he did a sacrifice in the Old Testament. He would say, it is finished. It's a banking term. That means a debt has been paid. And in that moment where all these people are waiting to bring their little something to Jesus, waiting to bring their little something to God, Jesus is on the cross, arms stretched out, and he screams, it is finished over all of Jerusalem, over all of the world, over all of eternity. You know why? Because he's a God who sees. That's the name of God, Jireh. A God who sees. Yahweh sees. That means wherever you find yourself this morning, he sees you. Whatever difficulty you're going through, he sees you. Can I give you some hope, my friends? Whatever struggle you're having, he sees you. He knows He's, he's, he's not somewhere else. He's walking alongside you. Isaac didn't leave. Excuse me, Abraham didn't leave Isaac's side. He walked up that mountain with him. Jesus is walking up that mountain with you. And he says, I see you. I know your name. If I care about the lilies in the valley, if I care about the sparrows in there, what do you think I think of you? My son, my daughter, what do you think I think of you? And yet I'm holding back from this God who has given everything to me. I'm holding back from this God who sacrificed his son for me. God will test your love by calling for your sacrifice. That's how God tests our love. By calling for our sacrifice. And, and you know why? Because he's God who sees. He, he goes, test me by my sacrifice. That's what God says to us. Test me by my sacrifice. And he sacrificed his one and only begotten son, the precious lamb of God, the King of kings, the Lord of the Lord, the name above all names, the name that at every, at the sound of his name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. He's like, he's like, catch it, catch it, catch it. I gave that up for you. So the big question is, what is your sacrifice? See, I didn't have to go through the litany of sacrifices that you need to make. Because the Spirit of God is speaking in you. Whether you believe him or not, whether you know him or not, the Spirit of God, because you are a created being, you are a spiritual being, is speaking in you. And it's telling you, that's what you should sacrifice. That's what you've been withholding from me. What's your sacrifice? Because here's what I believe. On the other side of that sacrifice is a blessing. On the other side of that sacrifice is a gift. On the other side of that sacrifice is a promise for a God who has been faithful, who was faithful 2,000 years ago on the cross, who was faithful 2,000 years before that on Mount Moriah. There is a God who sits in heaven and he's saying, I gave it all for you. What you going to do? Because I am the God who provides. I am Jireh, the God who sees. He sees. Everything you're dealing with, he sees. Every need you have, he sees. And what a hope we have in Jesus. He's enough. 
He's enough. If I never get anything else in this life, I got me, Jesus. If you never get another blessing in this life, you've got Jesus. If you don't have Jesus right now, he's offering you the greatest blessing of your life to call on his name as your, as his king, as your king, as your savior, as a deliverer. Jesus is saying, I'm enough. Whatever you're going through, Jesus is like, I'm enough. I'm enough. I am the provider. Afterwards, there's going to be prayer people down front. And before y'all run off to lunch, some of y'all need to come down front. You need to confess and say, I need this provider. I need Jaira. I need a God who sees. I want to give my life to that God. Go find a pastor in the lobby and be like, listen, I need that Jesus that that guy was sweating and yell it about I need him because I believe he sees all things knows all things and wants all things for me Father God I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters here at Hillside Lord Jesus I thank you for your word the conviction of your word the purity of your word the way it enlightens the heart The way it convicts the heart, God and I pray in this moment, God as we are convicted let us live in that tension of the hope that arises in you Let us breathe in the hope that you are a God who sees, a God who provides. And right now, God, see us in our innermost being, in our most brokenness. See us right now, Lord. And by the Son, provide for us what we need. Maybe it's a touch from you. Maybe it's an encouragement from you, God. Maybe it's salvation from you. Maybe it's freedom from brokenness this morning. Maybe it's freedom from shame. Maybe it's freedom from doubt. Maybe it's freedom from an anxiety, a depression, an illness in our body. God, give us what we need. But even if you don't, we praise you because you gave us everything we need in the form of your son, Jesus. And it is in his name, Jireh, all God's people said, amen.